Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video, we're going to look at the intramolecular aldol reaction. The intramolecular aldol reaction is intramolecular, meaning within the same molecule. The aldol reaction is one where the alpha carbon of an aldehyde or ketone will attack a carbonyl and give us a condensation. In the last few videos, we looked at the aldol reaction showing molecules attacking the same type or different type between aldehydes and ketones. But for this reaction, we're looking at a starting molecule that has two carbonyls on the same molecule, so that instead of attacking another molecule, it's going to attack itself. Say you're given a molecule like heptane diol, which is a seven carbon chain with an aldehyde on either end, and told to react it with NaOH. You should recognize a strong base and a carbonyl like an aldehyde or a ketone is going to give you an aldol reaction, but instead of looking for a second molecule to attack, we'll look at the same molecule and have one end attack the other. First thing we need to do is identify the alpha carbon. In this case, we have a carbonyl, so that's an alpha on the right, and a carbonyl on the left, meaning an alpha on the left. Given that the molecule is symmetrical, it's the same thing. So we'll just show that the alpha on the right is going to attack the carbonyl on the left, and that will close this molecule into a ring. We'll start with the shortcut for the product because that's faster and easier, and then look at the mechanism. Whenever you're working on a reaction, always, always number so that you can follow along and make sure that your product is correct. But here we're going to use a combination of traditional numbering and the numbering we saw in the condensation trick. That's video five in the Enolate series, which you can find on my website along with the Enolate practice quiz and cheat sheet at layerforsci.com slash Enolate. The trick we used for numbering is identifying the carbonyl carbon that does the attack. The carbonyl carbon that attacks is number one, the alpha carbon that attacks is number two, and the carbonyl that gets attacked is number three. At this point, I'll switch colors and just continue numbering so that I have them all accounted for. Four, five, six, and seven are in the ring. I numbered it four through seven because that comes after three, but notice that carbon number one is not in the ring. The ring is specifically forming between carbon three and the carbonyl carbon on the other end. That's two through seven for a six-membered ring, not a seven-membered ring. Start by drawing a six-membered ring and numbering two through seven, clockwise or counterclockwise, doesn't matter. I will show this as two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we simply fill in everything that's missing. The attacking carbonyl stays as is. That's group number one, attached to carbon two. So attached to carbon number two, we add a carbonyl, in this case an aldehyde, and number that one. Two and three is where we have the new bond, and that means carbon number three at lower temperatures will form an alcohol, at higher temperatures will form a pi bond between two and three. And that's it. That's everything else because we don't have any other substituents and our reaction is complete. Again, the key here is the V that I showed you is a little harder to recognize because it's partly in the ring, partly out of the ring. But if you start with the ring first and then remember to add number one out of the ring to carbon number two, everything else quickly falls into place. The reason I started with the trick rather than the mechanism is because if you see this on the exam, I recommend coming up with a product first. This will help you visualize exactly what is going on, and more importantly, it'll help you redraw the starting molecule so that if it looks like the product, the mechanism will be much easier to see. And trust me on this, the few seconds wasted to redraw is going to save you even more time in any confusion that you just eliminated. I'm going to take this seven carbon chain and redraw it looking like my final product. We can't simply redraw it as we see it because remember, carbon number two and three formed a new bond to each other. They're not bound to each other initially. So when we draw it out, we draw a bond between one and two, no bond between two and three because that forms later. So then we go down till seven, six, five, four, three and number it so you're following along. One, two, seven, six, five, four, three. Notice we went one, two, seven, six, five, four, three. It's confusing, but it helps you quickly put everything together. On the starting molecule, we have an aldehyde on carbon number one and another aldehyde on carbon number three. 
The way we set this up is to show that the bond can quickly happen between carbon 2 and 3, so let's show the mechanism. To start the mechanism, we'll show the alpha hydrogen, since the first step in the reaction is using a strong base to grab an alpha hydrogen and deprotonate the alpha carbon, but instead of showing the alpha carbon with a negative, we'll show the electrons collapsing towards the carbonyl, resonating onto the oxygen to give us a negative oxygen enolate intermediate. Oxygen had two lone pairs of electrons. Now it has a third lone pair from the pi bond collapsing and a negative charge, but we also have a pi bond between carbons one and two, giving us our enolate. The next step in the reaction is where the electrons from oxygen collapse back down, kicking out the pi bond towards the nucleophilic carbon number three. Remember that carbonyl carbon is partially positive, susceptible to attack, and that's what drives the next step. When carbon gets attacked, the electrons between carbon and oxygen collapse up onto the oxygen atom for another negative intermediate. This attack reforms the carbonyl on carbon number one. The electrons that formed a pi bond between carbon one and two are now sitting as a sigma bond between two and three. Carbon three now has an O minus with three lone pairs and a negative charge. Oxygen doesn't want that negative charge, so it'll reach out for a water molecule solution grab the proton and give oxygen back its electrons. This gives me the low temperature product with an alcohol at the beta position. Remember, two is alpha, three is beta, giving us a beta hydroxy aldehyde. If this reaction takes place at higher temperatures, you'll show one more step and that's the dehydration. An OH minus in solution will reach for that alpha hydrogen, but instead of collapsing towards the carbonyl, it'll collapse towards the beta carbon kicking out the OH minus. As a result, we'll have a second bond between carbons two and three for the alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde product. If you look back at our initial reaction, we've already predicted the beta hydroxy product. If you're told to use heat, simply remove the alcohol, put a pi bond between two and three, and that's exactly what we have here. By drawing the product first and then redrawing the starting molecule to resemble the product, meaning all the carbons are lined up exactly where they line up in the product, helps us quickly visualize where the new bonds form, where the attacks happen, and made the entire reaction so much faster. Let's try one more example. In this case, we're given a diketone and asked to react it in NaOH. First thing we recognize is that the molecule is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter if I choose an alpha from the right or the left, because the product will ultimately be the same. But the second thing to recognize is that each ketone has two different alpha carbons with the same degree of substitution, and that means there's no difference between a thermodynamic or kinetic enolate because they're both secondary carbons and will give us the same type of enolate. If we go to the outside of the carbonyl, that would be the red alpha. The inside of the carbonyl would be the green alpha, and the question is, regardless of symmetry, do we choose the red or the green for the reaction? I'll show you how to come up with the products of both so that you can clearly understand why we ultimately choose one over the other. We'll use the right ketone as the attacking group and the left as the carbonyl that gets attacked, and we'll start out by showing what happens when the green alpha carbon attacks the carbonyl. Show an arrow so that you can quickly picture where your ring is going to form, and notice that in this case we're going to form a three-membered ring. The carbonyl on the side of the attacking group is number one, the attacking alpha is two, and the one we attack is three. The inside of the ring is going to have one more carbon, which we'll call four, and then anything on the outside, we'll just call this A, B, C, D, and E. Again, it doesn't matter what you call it as long as you have an easy and simple way to identify what they are. The ring itself is made up of carbons 2, 3, and 4, and that's because 2 attacks 3, and there's 4 in between. So we start out by drawing a cyclopropane and numbering it 2, 3, and 4. Now let's see what happens to each one. Carbon number 1 is the carbonyl on the attacking group, and that means it keeps the carbonyl. We show this as attached to carbon number 2, but the chain we're adding is 1, C, D, and E. So we'll add 1, C, D, and E. Again, it doesn't matter how you number it as long as it allows you to quickly and easily recognize what you're doing. Carbon number 1 keeps the carbonyl. 
The one that we attacked is carbon number three. That means at lower temperatures, it'll be an alcohol, but at higher temperatures as given here, we have a pi bond between two and three. And then add in anything else that's missing. In this case, it's carbons A and B coming off of carbon number three. That would be A and B for our final product. Let's clean up the starting molecules so that we can start again. And this time, we'll use the red alpha as the attacking carbon. When the red carbon attacks the carbonyl, we have a much bigger ring, but the numbering still follows the same process. Number one is the attacking carbonyl, two is the attacking alpha carbon, three gets attacked. What else do we have? Four and five within the ring, and out of the ring we have two ethyl groups, so we'll put A and B on one side, C and D on the other. Count the carbons that are in the ring. Never assume your highest counted number is the number in the ring. Instead, count everything that's involved. This is a unique situation where carbon number one is in the ring, but let's see clearly what happened. If two attacked three, then the ring consists of two, three, four, five, and one. In this case, yes, for a total of five carbons. We draw a five-membered ring and then number it in this order. Don't go in a numerical order. Go with exactly what you see. We had carbon two attack number three. Following number three in the ring, we have four, five, which is attached to one. And yes, it does go in order here of one to five, but you want to follow what you're starting so that you don't get confused in the process. The attacking carbonyl will stay as a carbonyl. In this case, it's carbon number one that started as a ketone and ends as a ketone. Carbon number three lost this carbonyl at lower temperatures will give me an alcohol, but at higher temperatures, as presented here, we'll have a pi bond between two and three. What else do we have on this molecule? The numerical carbons are accounted for, but now we have to account for everything else. Coming off of carbon two, we have an ethyl group numbered A and B. So coming off of carbon two, we'll add an ethyl group and call them A and B. Coming off of carbon three, we have another ethyl group. So we'll add that over here and label those C and D. And that's our other product. The question is, which one do we prefer? And this is where you have to take ring strain into account. The ideal ring has six carbons. If you're presented with an option to form a five carbon ring, that's okay. Anything smaller than that is going to be very, very unstable. In this case, we have cyclopropene. Think about it. It's a triangle. A triangle will have an average bond angle of about 60 degrees. Here we have two sp hybridized carbon atoms. They want to be 120 degrees. This one's sp3, it wants 109.5. This is way, way too strained and very unstable. A five-membered ring, on the other hand, gives us larger angles and is much more stable. In organic chemistry, the more stable the product, the more likely the molecule is going to form. And that means for this reaction, we're not going to form the three-membered ring. Instead, the five-membered ring is going to be our major product. Professors love testing you on synthesis or backwards reaction. Given this product, come up with a starting material. The same kind of trick applies. You just have to know what patterns to look for. If you see a carbonyl on your molecule and another group next to it, either a pi bond or an alcohol, if you can count one, two, hit the start of the pi bond, or one, two, three, and hit the alcohol, you should recognize an aldol, an intramolecular aldol reaction if it's a ring. In this case, if the carbonyl is number one, this is two and three, that's a beta hydroxy carbonyl. And for the lower one, we have carbonyls number one, a pi bond between two and three, that's an alpha beta unsaturated molecule. Do the same trick backwards. If you have an alcohol on carbon three, simply break between two and three and turn that alcohol back into a carbonyl. If you see a pi bond between carbons two and three, recognize that pi bond came from dehydration because you had an alcohol on three and then do the same thing. Break between two and three and turn that alcohol back into a carbonyl. Now here's the best part. Students think you have to give a linear product because that's the way it tends to be presented, but you can draw it however you want as long as you're correct. So why not draw exactly what you see here? and it definitely helps the number. So we'll call this four, five, six, and seven, showing us that we have a seven carbon chain. As we see it, that's carbon three, four, five, six, seven, attached to two and attached to one because we broke everything else. Carbon number three gets a carbonyl. In this case, it's an aldehyde. Carbon number one is also a carbonyl. That's our aldehyde. 
The two products are the same, so we don't have to show the starting molecule for both. Just recognize that the alcohol goes to the dehydrated product, and that means in going backwards, we'd go in this direction and number it out. Put the numbers there again. We have one, two, seven, six, five, four, three. And then if you want to be fancy and show a very nice product, redraw it. Recognize that you have a seven carbon chain. So we'll draw seven carbons. You can even number it the same way. Your professor is not going to take off points. One, two, seven, six, five, four, three. Where carbon number one has a carbonyl for an aldehyde and carbon number three has a carbonyl for an aldehyde. Let's show the same process for our second example. We identify the carbonyl carbon and number that one. Continue numbering in the direction of a pi bond or an alcohol. In this case, we have a pi bond, so we'll call that carbon two. Attached to it, we have carbon three. Recognize that you have to break between two and three, and you can first put an alcohol on three and then make it into a carbonyl. Number the rest of it just so you know where to go with it. In this case, you can continue numbering the way I showed or recognize that because this will form one continuous chain, you can start another set of numbers and say that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why am I doing it this way? Because we can skip the funky product and go straight to the linear one if you understand what I just did. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and then add back anything that you see on this molecule. On carbon number six, we have a carbonyl. On carbon number three, we have a carbonyl. And there's our starting product. If you were not comfortable going directly to the nice starting molecule, that's fine. Let's redraw it exactly as we see it here. We have nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, with a bond between two and three broken. We see a carbonyl on six, we know that a carbonyl has to be on three, and there's our starting molecule. You can then redraw it for the nice and linear version, but both are correct. Be sure to join me in the next video where we look at the reaction mechanism and tricks for a clays and condensation. You can find it along with the entire series Enolate Practice Quiz and Cheat Sheet on my website, layofforsci.com slash enolate. Be sure to hit the thumbs up button below if you found this video helpful, and if you believe it'll save you even a couple of seconds on your orgo exam.